Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Rebecca Friedman, the founding director of the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab here at FIU in Miami, and I'm really proud to welcome you today to season five of Coffee and Conversations with Miami Book Fair. We have a really compelling and timely conversation waiting for us today, so I, I'm excited about that. This series that we've been doing um, began at a point by now about two years ago, right in the middle of the pandemic, when everybody was talking about pivoting <laughs> and that was everyone's favorite word. We started Coffee and Conversations as a way of strengthening community ties and supporting the great work being done by our many community partners. We've explored a host of topics um, from how the pandemic affected museums and cultural institutions, histories of anti-Blackness in museum spaces and beyond. We've chatted with community partners and worked with amazing authors from the Miami Book Fair. So please uh, have a look at our YouTube channel and watch past episodes. Now with this season, we're again honored to be working with the Miami Book Fair by highlighting a number of book fair authors to provide a kind of teaser for the fair itself. So we encourage everyone to go to the fair. Briefly, our format is very simple, lasts about 30 minutes. And at the end, we are happy to take any questions should there be from the audience. So you can use the Q&A at the bottom. So without wasting any more of our precious minutes, allow me to introduce today's moderators and our author, Eli Saslow. Today, we have uh, talking with our author, an amazing FIU team, Andrea Panza and Enrique, Enrique Rossell, both my dear colleagues with the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab. Andrea Fanta is an associate professor of Latin American literature and culture and a faculty fellow at the lab. Along with Enrique Rossell, she is the co-creator of the Our Stories Project. Her research project focuses on the creation of the Latin American diaspora digital archive. She's the author of Residues of Violence, Colombian Cultural Practices from 1990 to 2010 and the co-editor of Territories of Conflict, Traversing Cultural Studies in Colombia. Enrique Rossell is one of our own FIU grads and he is the program manager at the WPHL. <clears throat> and he was for years, the student programs coordinator at the Honors College where his creativity ran free as it does with us at the WPHL. With honors, he had a podcast called More Than a Major. Um, and he has also completed a body of photography work taken from March 2020 to March 2021 called Close to Home, documenting life during the pandemic in Miami inside the Sedano's shopping plaza on 127th and 137th, acting as a kind of microcosm for Miami as a whole. And so I hope today we will also hear about the two of the projects that they're doing together, Our Stories, which focuses on FIU students and the ways in which they have coped um, during the pandemic through visual <clears throat> art, through um, photography, and also through writing. So they'll tell you about that. And also, and not last, um, not least, last but not least, we have Eli Saslow, our uh, Miami Book Fair author, who is a reporter for the Washington Post. He is the author of 10 Letters, American Hunger and Rising Out of Hatred which won the 2019 Dayton Literary Peace Prize. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory, explanatory reporting in 2014 and was a Pulitzer finalist in feature writing in 2013, 2016, and 2017. The series on which his latest book, Voices from the Pandemic is based, won the 2020 George Polk Award for Oral History. Today, he and my colleagues are going to talk about Voices from the Pandemic, Americans Tell Their Stories of Crisis, Courage, and Resilience. Thank you all so much for being here, and especially Eli, thank you for being here today. Thank you, my, my pleasure. I'm excited to talk about all this, especially because it sounds like, uh, you know, Enrique and Andrea, you're both doing your own, like, important work, sort of cultivating stories in this space, which is great. 
Thank you. We're super excited to have you here. Um, and um, Rebecca, I'll go ahead and put you in the audience, okay? Please. There we go. Okay, Eli, like I said, we've been so excited to speak with you today um, and kind of get started on all of these questions. One thing I will say before we get started is for everyone who's listening, um, whether you're listening later on YouTube or currently right now, uh, we are going to be covering some heavy topics, you know, related to the pandemic. So, um, you know, feel free to listen. And I hope that this helps you cope and relate. I know it's pretty fresh for all of us, but um, the book has been really cathartic for me and Andrea. And uh, the, the, the topics that we're going to be talking about are very, very interesting, but also heavy at times. So, um, we hope that you enjoy and uh, but are also aware of that. So Eli, thank you so much for being here. We're excited to speak with you today. Jumping into the first question, because I know we only have like um, until about 4.30ish. Sometimes we go a little bit over. Um, so I just want to say that as soon as I opened your book, um, I got goosebumps immediately uh, because the prologue of your book starts off with briefings from the World Health Organization from January 4th, 2020, all the way through March 11th, 2020. And it just instantly brought me back to the way that COVID-19 started off as background noise and in like in between commutes to work or meetings that I was going to and then suddenly it just felt like it brought the whole world to a halt and it felt like everyone was, was paralyzed with anxiety based in action during that time but it seems like you you really sprung into action collecting these interviews and stories um, so Andrea and I were wondering looking back on this timeline and reflecting on kind of like that timeline from the World Health Organization when did you start noticing COVID as something that we needed to keep an eye on as humans um, but also, like, at what point of your timeline, your specific timeline as Eli, did you realize that these interviews were work that you needed to do yourself? Yeah, great question. And the truth is, I think I, I was probably like the two of you, where I was sort of um, going somewhat blindly through through the through the world and and uh, doing my job as I normally do it in in January and February. I mean, usually. My work for the Washington Post is often like very embedded reporting. So, so typically I'm writing these long narrative stories and I'm spending a ton of time with the people I'm writing about. So I, if I'm writing about uh, deportation, I'm, I'm embedding with a family and going back to, to Mexico and, and documenting a family separation that way. If I'm writing about you know, uh, the opioid epidemic, I'm, I'm with somebody as they're in the throes of addiction or trying to, to recover. I, I go and I sort of interview people, of course, but also I'm using my eyes and, and I'm there on site all the time. And that's what I was doing in January and February and then into the beginning of March where I happened to be sort of embedded into a little rural hospital um, in, in Washington state, a struggling hospital uh, about to close like a lot of rural hospitals in the country. And I was there when they got their first COVID case. And, and I sort of realized during that trip, um, not only how massive this pandemic was going to be, uh, but also that it was going to change some of the, the ways I could do my job, at least in the foreseeable future. Like suddenly getting on an airplane and going to spend a ton of time essentially like living with the people that I was writing about would be putting them at some um, significant risk. And so I, I also had to quickly start thinking about what are ways that I can still document this like historic moment um, and tell stories that are are personal and intimate and that matter if I can't go and be there and spend time always with the people that I'm writing about. So that's that's sort of is where the idea for this oral history project began. That's incredible. So basically you were right in the target area in the Pacific Northwest, because I remember looking at the news and seeing uh, mm -hmm. particularly this doctor from, from Seattle, I believe he he is right so um that must have been you know like one of the first like big hits of the of the pandemic yeah and what was amazing you know it's kind of all this stuff is is crazy to think back on but it what was amazing was how little anybody knew like the doctors in this hospital they they were they were all terrified they they didn't know really what COVID was or how to treat it. Um, it was a hospital with like no infrastructure to set up like isolation rooms or anything like this. So, you know, in those first days there, I sort of saw a, a, a whole community um, like just being paralyzed. You know, the, 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 the hospital didn't know what was happening. There was so much fear, right? And, and um, I have three, three little kids, uh, like elementary school age. And, and, you know, when I left for that trip, they were all in school, uh, like everything was normal. And when I came back from the trip, I remember sort of telling friends like that th there's schools not going to be happening for very much longer. Mm -hmm. Like um, I sort of, I think because I sort of started at that like ground zero place a little bit, I had a sense that, um, you know, not, not only, not only what was to come in terms of just trying to keep people physically safe, but also the, the massive, 
collateral effects that this pandemic was going to have, um, you know, and, and also how how disproportionately uh, certain people in the country have been hit, which which um, I hope is is something that you know it, it should have been clear, uh, obvious and clear, and it should have been all of our number one priority before the pandemic. Um, but I, I hope that uh, people have been able to see like how you know in the United States people who've been disenfranchised and disempowered always get the worst of, of whatever happens. Uh, that's what happened here, and and the legacy of this will continue to live in those spaces for a long time. So I hope I hope our attention can live in those spaces too. Yeah, I no. What a what a what an experience it it must have been. Um, so you were in Seattle and then you came back home. You live in Portland, correct? Correct. Yeah. I and came then up. how did you decide it? How did the project come about? You said, okay, I'm gonna you know this is gonna spread. I'm gonna have to find people all over the country walk with walk us on how the process began for for the book or the sure. project so i think for me anyway like writing wise um if i if i begin with an idea that's too big or, or too grand it can be like a little paralyzing right so i guess the first thing is i didn't think immediately i, I didn't know what, i didn't know yet that covid i thought well, for, for maybe two or three weeks, our kids are going to be out of school and things are going to shut down for a couple of months. I didn't know, and, and probably very few people knew that we were, were at the beginning of what was going to be um, a fully like world world altering event that would go on for years at this point. So what I did first was try to figure out how can I, how can I tell a story? Like how, how can I um, do what I, I think comes, uh, I hope naturally to me a little bit as a journalist and also what is like the heart of my job and why I want to do the work that I do, which is how, how can I find somebody who's experiencing this in a way that matters? And maybe by documenting that experience, I can make other people realize how big this is and what it's like and what it feels like. So, you know, initially that was just, I want, I wanted to find somebody who um, in these early days where, where this, this virus was mostly still a rumor that everybody was hearing about. I wanted to find somebody who was being affected by it in a massively personal way and, and was watching somebody die that they, that they loved and cared about and didn't understand it. So, uh, you know, I, I did what I usually do, which is I called a bunch of people and started having conversations with a bunch of people and learned, learned from all of those conversations and then decided in a series of say a dozen conversations with people who were in that situation one of those conversations was was with a guy named Tony Sizemore and um, his partner of, of many years uh, it was on her way to being the first COVID death in Indiana um, and Tony you know somebody who probably had never spoken to a journalist before who'd never heard of COVID other than seeing something about a cruise ship that had been sort of sidelined on the news um, he suddenly was watching this woman that he loved uh, like disintegrate at an at a unspeakable pace and and you know him trying to make sense of that in our conversations and and him trying to sort of sift through his own confusion felt to me like um what we were all trying to do in in some way and he was doing it in a much more uh you know dire situation so then i decided i, I want to write about tony and and honestly throughout the pandemic kind of almost every week that's how these stories unfolded is, is i would think What's the place in the pandemic now that I'm curious about? What's what's the tension point in the country that maybe I can find somebody who's in the swirl of it who can illuminate it in, in a way that feels urgent and important and necessary? Um, and and by doing that one week after the next, um, you know, at the end of 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 the the 12 or 18 months, um, you know, certainly until vaccines first became available, I realized, wow, I've, I've accumulated 30 or 40 of these. Um, of these really like powerful testimonies basically from people uh, in real time about what they're going through. And, and then I realized rather than this just being a series of stories that I'm doing for the post, uh, this I want this to be a collection. I, I, it's, um, it all speaks to the same story. And, and, uh, and I think really the power of, of this journalism is that it comes directly from the people who, who were experiencing it. It's, it's a direct relationship, I hope, between the reader and, and, and somebody like Tony, somebody in the center of the swirl. No, and I think you've done such an amazing job introducing the book when you say, these are, this is not my voice. This is the voice of these people and their experiences. You're, you're there to compile and to edit and probably to polish the language in order to, for other people to make, um, make sense of those conversations. And you've done an amazing job. Oh, that's nice of you to say. And that's, that's also, that's exactly right. That's what the, I mean, every word in this book, um, 
you know, if, if the writing is, if people think the writing is good, that's great, but I don't, I don't deserve the credit for it because every single word in this book was said to me, right? Like these were, um, you know, what I was doing was for each person in the book, I was talking to them for a massive amount of time. And, and um, I think that's what it takes, first of all, to build trust with people, to, to make them feel comfortable sharing their stories. Um, and also, you know, to, to get to the heart of what people are experiencing. So with somebody like Tony, with every, with every chapter in this book, it wasn't just one conversation, it was probably 10 or 15 conversations. And, and in the end, I had, you know, 100 pages of, of transcription from our conversations. And then I would go through and I would edit those and, and, you know, condense them and sort of structure them into the stories of what people had gone through, but all, all in their words, all in their language. And I think that's also, I hope part of the power is that these people feel like themselves because it, it is, it's them, it's them communicating what's happened to them. Yeah. And we, and we were actually specifically wondering about that. So you answered another one of our questions. Uh, so this was primarily virtual then, or like over the phone conversations yeah, that you were having with people. Yeah. So, like as the pandemic went on, I started to do uh, a little bit more in person, but it was often over the phone um, or like, you know, I'd sort of use whatever tools that I could. So uh, say there's a guy named Burnell Cotlin who was running a little grocery store in, in the Ninth Ward of Louisiana mm -hmm. and, and customers couldn't pay anymore. They were, they'd all lost their jobs. Uh, and, and so anyways, I was talking to Burnell over the phone all week. I would say to him like, Hey man, can you just, can you put me on FaceTime on your phone and kind of flip me around at the counter so I can get a sense of the store so I can, I can hear what people Love are saying that. There, so I can, I can feel a little bit what's going on there. Um, and, and, you know, then after I finished talking to Burnell, I would, I would call and talk to his wife because even though her story was, was not going to necessarily, I wasn't going to be quoting her in the story for, about Burnell. She would remember things about what was happening that maybe Burnell hadn't remembered. And I would bring those back to Burnell and that would like spark his own memories or spark his own ideas. So, you know, it, it was, it was a lot of that kind of thing. It would be, you know, hey, can you send me the text messages that your customers are sending you? Can you just sort of trying to, to unearth whatever whatever I could to get a sense of texture and feel for what somebody was going through? But yeah, often having to do it um, from afar, which was which was a really new challenge. And I think I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Um, I learned a lot about reporting that way. I think I think some of it was, uh, you know, I let the conversations be really wandering, like like um, because really what I needed to do in order to build trust and make it work was keep people on the phone. And, and, and so that sometimes meant that we would, I, the conversation would go into avenues that I never imagined it would go into. And, and to be honest at the time in my own short sightedness, I would kind of be thinking to myself, this is not going to actually be in the story. Like what, why are we talking about this thing? But then like, sometimes I would discover that I just had not been smart enough to see that that's where the magic was. Like there, there was one doctor in, in North Dakota, uh, who was, you know, he was like North Dakota was having an awful surge, um, a place where people were in denial of the virus, hadn't hadn't taken masking seriously, just ha hadn't done much to mitigate the spread. And this doctor was the only doctor there. And all of his patients were, were dying, including both of his parents um, who he treated and who he just watched die. So in, in, our, in our conversations, like, you know, those were the things that I was really interested in, right? But one of the things that this doctor wanted to talk about a lot was World War II. He was like really fascinated with World War II. And a, a lot of the time, honestly, I was like, well, why, why are we still talking about World War II in my own mind, right? But he was telling me these stories about how his parents, um, you know, in their generation, like they, they had, they'd taken great pride in sacrificing dur during World War II and, and not, not having, not getting married until they could save enough sugar rations to, to make a wedding cake, right? That was, that was like his parents' great pride. And, and, you know, now both of them had died um, in this place because the community was not willing to sacrifice any of the things around them at any time. So, you know, these stories that initially I kind of thought like, wow, this is, I, I don't really know why we're going in this direction. I would read back through the notes and be like, of course, this is the heart of the thing. This is this is it. So that was that was a great lesson. I think is is um, sometimes letting rather than being directive in conversation, just letting things go, and and um, that's where you sometimes discover like the truth of of what people are really experiencing. Yeah, I think Andrea and I were wondering about that because we we really admired how personal um, and intimate all of the stories felt. So we were like, this must have taken forever, you know, and also. Um, just like the the virtual communication aspect of it that we were all dealing with throughout the pandemic, um, did that affect your level of intimacy and trust with the with um, the interviewees? Totally, it did. Although, like the truth is, 
this is maybe a little hard to articulate, but but um, in in a year that was there was like uh, a year and a half, whatever it is, that was so defeating for so many reasons, right? Like we, I feel like as as a country, uh, we're so catastrophically polarized, um, and 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 the pandemic, uh, you know, it, it isolated us into our own bubbles even more, right? In, into our own physical spaces, uh, you know, all all of the other things that the like. The, the inequity that's so much at the heart of what America is was exacerbated in every way. Like we 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 had um, a, a really awful year and and a lot of reasons to be really frustrated with like political and systemic dysfunction. And and so for me, like what ended up being a little bit like uh, my my coping mechanism was these conversations with people, people who were like totally unlike me, people who'd never met me other than having me call them up as a random person on the phone and saying you know, hey, I think these like sometimes really painful traumatic moments are important and I want to hear about them. That's a ton to ask. And, and the fact that that people are still capable of building that trust, right? That, that uh, somebody can still narrate the experiences of their lives to somebody that they don't know that well with honesty, with heart, with empathy, um, that was in its own way restorative. So, so uh, I guess like every time sort of I, I, that that is what like gave me some faith through the year. Mm -hmm. I guess is is mm -hmm. uh, conversations that were of course sometimes taxing. It's it's um, talking to people about really difficult things uh, can be draining. But like the 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 reminder of sort of the common humanity that that I I got to experience in those calls. I hope is like also what is some part of what's in the book in this like super disparate um, you know messed up moment that we're living in. There there are all kinds of people who are still like like working through it and trying to do their best. And, and um, you know, and, and some of that I think is also having the courage to talk honestly about what they're experiencing. Totally, totally. And, and I think that's really interesting because I think Andrea and I had a little bit of that same experience on a smaller scale with the Our Stories project that we did that we're going to go into a little bit more in depth in a second. But we did a project where we interviewed students. We sent them a disposable camera to capture like their experience over the, the summer, like that summer 2020. Particularly um, lockdown. It was during yeah. the lockdown. During yeah. the lockdown. We even mailed it to them and everything. And then we interviewed them for a podcast that's up everywhere. And, and, uh, and uh, but it was, I think we had talked about this, Andrea and I, that speaking to students about their experience was a very cathartic um, experience. And, and it, it helped because it, we weren't getting that human connection anywhere else, except for these interviews that we were doing. Yeah. But something else that you brought up also kind of goes along with with one of the questions that we had when it comes to the, the political disparity in the country during this time. So I felt like I, as I kept reading the book, there was this reoccurring theme of guilt and regret in many of these stories. People who tried to follow CDC guidelines but had to work um, and got their mother sick, for example, or people who denied the virus and lost family members. And I think one of the most prominent parts of 2020 and COVID was the presidential election and COVID conspiracies and denial that you covered a lot in the book. Yep. There were some really heartbreaking stories in there, like Tony Green's story where he denied COVID, he hosted a party and then lost many family members or and never had a chance to say goodbye to many of them, which is incredibly heartbreaking or or Glenn Burney, who was a business owner who was heavily impacted by COVID restriction on his business and ultimately lost his family restaurant. So um, a really interesting part of your work here that you mentioned is that you got to hear perspectives from across political affiliations or personal beliefs. Um, so after hearing some of these interviews, uh, what do you think is the relationship between COVID and the growing political divide in the country? And do you think your book can help bridge that political divide or, or helps bridge that political divide? What a great question. Um, I mean, I think, unfortunately, the relationship right now between COVID and our political divides uh, is like ridiculously strong. I mean, just um, I had sort of a full circle moment because actually these last <clears throat> three weeks I've been back at that same rural hospital in Washington State reporting uh, because Washington State has done a, a, a mandate for all healthcare care workers where they have to be vaccinated or they lose their jobs. Um, and and you know to me living in a in a city where uh, most healthcare workers are are willingly vaccinating um, that it doesn't seem like that would be a, a huge deal. But in in many rural parts of, the, of this country where like disinformation is it has a stronghold, um, politics are a big part of that. Like I'd say like very pro-Trump areas, these vaccine mandates are uh, a devastating massive issue, right? So like this little hospital in rural Washington which is the only way that this community and like a, a very large disparate community gets healthcare, half of their staff said, we don't, we don't wanna take the vaccine, we won't be vaccinated. So if that happens, the hospital would have to close. So I, I went there and, and 
did what I usually do and spent a bunch of time writing about basically how this community has become totally divided, right? Between people who, uh, people who think that the, the vaccines are, um, you know, are, are embedding them with little microchips or are, are making them magnetic or all of these other conspiracy theories that although they sound to me sometimes ludicrous on their face, uh, the tragic thing is that huge percentage of people, percentages of people in this country believe them. And, and so the disinformation associated with COVID has also become a huge part of our political moment. And, and I guess, you know, the challenge sometimes, and uh, it's something that I've thought a lot about and like sort of thematically, I think in a lot of my work is like, how do we, how do we go about changing people's minds, right? Like when, when, when it seems like they're so far gone, like wh whether that's um, in, in terms of like conspiracy thinking or white supremacist ideology or all of these other things where you just, it, it's like, at some point, do we, um, do, do we like make an attempt to, for instance, in, in like the case of a mandate, basically say, get on board or get out. And, and I think that there's a moment where there's a time for that, right? Like where, where it makes sense. Um, but also in this little community, watching the hospital administrator, like who had, had constantly taped up this thing on his desk about treating people with kindness and grace and listening and respect. And even if he totally disagreed with so many of these people's ideas, finding a way to still you know, empathize with, with their humanity, I think is important. So, so to me, with somebody like Tony Green, who denied the virus, invited people in his family over, basically as like an F you to, to Texas when it said it was shutting down. Um, and then a lot of people got sick, uh, including Tony and including his father-in-law who he loved um, and who died. Like there's a version of that story where I think the reaction can be like, well, you're, you know, like you're dumb and that's what you get. Like you made this, this catastrophic mistake and, and this is what you deserve. Uh, for me, I guess I hope that as a person myself and, and as a journalist and, and um, I hope reflected in the book is like, there's a way to separate uh, somebody's, somebody's ideas and actions from being able to empathize with their suffering. And, and, and you can do both of those things. And, and I think if we lose the ability to empathize with what people go through, or that's a dangerous path, right? It's, um, so for me, it's like, yes, uh, he made catastrophic mistakes and those mistakes have consequences and we need to do something to address those mistakes at the point of the mistake. But still what he went through is brutal and, and I'm, I'm sorry. And I, I want to hear about it and I want to, I want to learn about it and know about it and, and um, have him feel seen in it. So it's a, it's complicated, but I, but I think that that's kind of the moment that we're, we're at in a country is where, you know, there's a big, <clears throat> there's a big divide, particularly like ideologically on the left in America right now with like, what do you do with, uh, with speech and ideas that you don't agree with? Like, is it, um, it, it, it do, do you uh, silence, protest, uh, do things to, to resist? I think all of those tactics have meaningful, important roles uh, it, where we are. But also I think that um, discourse and conversation, particularly if these ideas are coming from people who might listen to you or who you're close to or people in your family or your extended network who are sharing things on Facebook, if you don't have the courage to have those conversations, then definitely they're not gonna change, right? So it's, I think both of those tactics have a place and, and it really depends on who you are to the person or the idea that you're trying to change. Thank you so much for that. And I, I definitely think I felt that reading your book, but I'll pass it over to Andrea. <laughs> no, I think, I think, I think you're right. And it's, and it's, um, I think it's something that we felt a lot uh, throughout, I don't know, perhaps the last four or five years. And I think it has been completely exacerbated by COVID. And, but there is, there is a listening part where you listen to someone else and the, the emotional connection where that emotional connection is completely devoid from the ideological uh, perspectives that you're able to connect. So it's important to listen to each other um, and to understand the feelings, right? In a way for the same experience that you had, I had it and I had to go through during the summer and drive through the country. I even drove from Miami to Seattle because I was like, I don't understand this place. And this is a place where my daughters are going to have to grow up. And I, I am scared. I am really scared of this place. Yeah. But it, it's about listening and reconnecting in, in many, many ways. I, I, I just because this is what I do, I have to flip it on you and, and ask, like, I really want to hear about that trip. And like, if there were, <laughs> 
if there were parts of it, or I don't know if there were things that you discovered on that drive, good or bad, that, that changed the way you felt about like this country in this moment. That's a story for another conversation. I have plenty, but I wanted to document everything. I documented my daughter's conversations inside the car. Uh, I gave my daughter some cameras. It was it was really, it was life changing for me. And I'd like to do a documentary about it. But it was really important for me as an immigrant and as a as a as a newly uh, citizen new citizen of the United States. It was important for me because yeah. I'm really scared of yeah. what's ahead. That's I I well when you do document it, please let me know and then let all of us know because it sounds really powerful. Yeah. <laughs> I think like what you said about you know listening and finding a way to connect with people is right because also it's that listening that gives you the opportunity to impact their thinking, right? Like if you if you just, you know, if, if you can build a little bit of a relationship with people and this this is what I do and try to try to do all the time in my work is is I show up as a stranger in people's lives, whether over the phone or in person. And I try to build a massive amount of trust quickly. And, and it's a complicated trust because I'm saying to people, you know, you don't have any control over what I necessarily write, all these other things, but I think what's happening here is important. I want you to tell tell me everything like you would only tell like a, a super close friend and you'd tell it to the friend with the idea that that friend would tell nobody, but you're gonna tell me with the expectation that I'm gonna tell as many people as I can, right? So that's that's a really fragile trust to build. Um, but the fact that it's possible to build those kind of relationships and and you know that that oftentimes when I show up in these places like this this rural hospital in Washington, you know the 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 anti-vax community, all these other people are um, immediately suspicious of me. But if that if I can if I can listen and be a decent person in a conversation for 20 minutes, all that goes away, right? And like all the labels in their head of like, well. We don't we don't like the 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 liberal media or the Washington Post, but this guy seems okay. Like it's it it falls away really fast. It really fast. So if you can get to that point, then you actually have earned your way into having meaningful conversations that maybe instead of just like building a wall and and being like immediately divisive, actually have some ability to just sow a few seeds of doubt in the way people see things. Well, Eli, I think we I think we will do one quick one more question. Uh, we can go over a little bit because <laughs> we had so we had like four more questions for you, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately no, we won't be able to get I'm, to them. I'm happy to answer. So, yeah. yeah. So um, this is kind of a two parter, like all of my questions. But so I mentioned that we did a project called Our Stories earlier. So in that in that uh, in that project. Uh, like I said, we sent students disposable cameras. We had them write written reflections over everything that they went through over that summer. We conducted interviews with them to talk about everything that they went through. And it was it was it was absolutely heartbreaking at times. And there was so much that happened during that summer that we would forget about sometimes that our students would bring up that was like crucial for them. Like we would have international students, you know, who were part of the project who were highly impacted at one point when the Trump administration announced that um, international students may not be able to stay in the country if um if they aren't taking classes in person and they were scrambling for those two weeks until that was taken away. Um, so there was so much that happened and so many experiences that we were able to capture with those students. And then also I, I had mentioned that I did a, I did a little personal project that I, I would consider myself a photographer, right? Um, and, uh, but you know, during that time of the pandemic, we, I wasn't able to like go out and take pictures the way that I usually would do on the street. So I decided to start walking around my neighborhood on 127th and 137th in Miami, hyper-local destination um, to Inesedanos. Uh, it's like a Hispanic chain um, grocery store. But I started creating these, these relationships with people, like you said, these super special relationships with people that I'd photograph every day and see every day. But the, the part that was hard for me is that um, at a certain point, sometimes people stopped showing up. You know, um, I stopped seeing people because they would get sick and and I would lose that that friend group. Right. So combining these two experiences of like creating these relationships with people, whether it's through our stories or or through photographing people on the street um, through this time, we were wondering if if did you do you keep in contact with any of these people in the stories from your book today? And is was it difficult for you to create connections with people that were going through such a difficult time, um, like with the stories we heard with Darlene or Bruce? Who had family members in the hospital with COVID or fighting COVID themselves. So was it difficult for you to start these relationships um, and then maybe not be able to see people because they got sick or, or, or their family members got sick? And how was that uh, for you? And do you keep in contact with them? Yeah, uh, great, great question. And, and I share that experience sometimes of, um, you know, building relationships with people and then, uh, you know, just seeing 
not even the relationship disappear, but feeling like the people have disappeared, and and that um, and also knowing that they've disappeared because because of what what's been what's what's been unfairly asked of them, and and uh, you know in, in terms of whether that's continuing to have to go to work and getting sick or all these other things. So you know I would say in some ways actually I find it easier to build not easier, but it's you can build a deep trust more quickly when when um, when people are experiencing like major challenges in their life, because you're talking about serious stuff, right? If I'm talking to somebody about you know, giving CPR to his mother and, and her final days, and I'm, I'm the one person maybe in his life that he's having those conversations with, that forms, uh, that forms sort of like a closeness pretty quickly. And so actually then the challenge becomes, um, you know, on the other side of the story, on the other side of publication every time, I feel like if I've if I've asked this person to confide in me during this really difficult time, it's even if the story's done, it's not the decent thing to do as a person to then be like, well, yeah. I'm not interested anymore because I'm writing about something else. That's not how I feel, um, and it also is not the right thing to do. Like if I've if I've said I want to know about this, I want to hear about this, um, and that person has chosen to trust me, then I feel like I I owe it to that person to continue that relationship if they want to continue it. And oftentimes I want to continue it too, right? I've, I've become invested. I care about what's happening to them. So a lot of these relationships uh, from the book and, and from, you know, I expect they will last a really long time. And, and for, in some cases, that means there's, there's a woman, Lori Wagner, who was uh, working alone at a, at a store in North Carolina and having a lot of mass confrontations. She, I, I'd say every two or three days, she she's in touch about like what's going on in the store. Like she's just that, I was that person to her for a really intense couple of weeks, and so I'm still that person to her. And then in other cases with Tony, it might be you know him sending me a note every every three months or or so. It's it's really different. Um, but I but I value that. Like the 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 relationships are at um, the heart of this job, and the greatest privilege of being a journalist is in a country that is so polarized. I I get to in some small way. Like I get this this sort of window or passport into um, versions of of a life that are not my own, and that's I think that's hugely valuable. That's also like why I think you know journalism is valuable, good fiction is valuable, good documentary storytelling, good good fictional storytelling, and any like it is we need to grow our ability to empathize with people's experiences, uh, and and I think the way that you do that is by going along in 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 some way, whatever way you can. I think, and I think that's exactly what your book does. Andrea and I were speaking about that, you know, so many times about that. It just helps, um, it helped, made us um, a lot more empathetic towards everybody, everybody's story and different stories that are not our own. And we spoke about that as well, about how during this time, it was a very, you know, 2020 was a very hard year, but it, it was also really special in the sense that everyone was isolated during this time, but they were also really eager to connect and happy to open up if you tried. And I feel like your book is a, is a huge testament to that. So definitely everybody go out and buy this book everywhere. Okay. Make sure to get Voices from the Pandemic um, by sure. Eli Saslau. And there, if you want to say something before we sign off and I bring Rebecca back on. No, thank you for an amazing book. And just one other thing. I think those, uh, that experience that you've had with all these interviewees, in a way, it's what Enrique and I had, because we were interviewing these students, right. like, a lot of times, and we met, we've met only once, but we've been together in this project for a year and a, a year half. and a half. We've only yeah. met and, one time. Yeah, and we've only met mm -hmm. one time. It's, uh, can, can you... Uh, I'm sure it's up in available places, but, and maybe everybody listening already knows, but where, where can I, is it, where can I read it? Where can I see it? Is it, is it, is it available places? Oh yeah. Yeah. We'll send you, we'll send you a link. It's on ourstories.fiu.edu. It's all up there. And we, it's, it's only our first cohort. We have a second cohort that we're currently interviewing right now that is going to be up soon as well. Great. Um, well, thanks. Thanks to you both for doing the important work. That's awesome. No, no. Thank you. Thank you for your work. This is seriously like we're like fangirling here, to be honest. Well, likewise. <laughs> uh, thank you. Oh, my gosh. Thank all of you for an amazingly beautiful conversation. I was kind of listening. You couldn't see me, but I am incredibly moved by all of it. So thank you. And thank you for the book, Eli, um, and for sharing, sharing your book and your words with us today, all of you. And Eli is just one of the many authors from around the world who are participating in the Miami Book Fair 2021, the nation's, the nation's largest gathering of writers and readers of all ages. 
Um, they are very much looking forward, the authors, to sharing their work, thoughts, and new ideas with everyone in person and online. So please visit Miami Book Fair for more information and also go see Eli as well because he will be at the Miami Book Fair um, and follow Miami Book Fair at, at rather at Miami Book Fair and also hashtag Miami Book Fair 2021 um, from November 14th to the 21st. Uh, thank you again, all of you and audience and everyone out there, please um, join us as our journey continues on next Tuesday when my colleague Julio Capo will interview um, Ada Ferrer, who wrote Cuba and American History, Tuesday at four o'clock. So we can't wait for that one too. So thank you all again very much in honor. Thanks so much. Keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you all. Bye. Same. Same. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Eli. Bye, everybody.